just by way of introduction, uh, I recently retired from the National Park Service. I worked at the Harpers Ferry Center, which is in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, about 50 miles west of Washington, D.C. And this is the national center where all media for all national parks is created. So if you go to a park visitor center and look at the exhibits, that those exhibits are designed at Harpers Ferry Center. The movies are produced there. The publications are produced there, the wayside exhibits. And fortunately for me, lots of maps. It's, it's, I've had a career, it's like working in a candy store, uh, working on various national park uh, maps. At any time, I'd be working on a couple dozen. But a, a park that really has a, a special place in my heart is the Grand Canyon. Um, there are four cartographers that work at Harpers Ferry Center. We divvy up the 417 national parks uh, among us. And fortunately for me, Grand Canyon landed on my lap. And you know, topographically and historically, there's probably no better park to map. And that's what I'm going to talk about today are some of the, uh, the, the maps that I've made of Grand Canyon National Park um, through the years. Okay. So if you were to go um, to the park uh, this morning, uh, drive up to the entry, entrance station, pay your 25 bucks to get in, the friendly ranger uh, would give you a brochure, and this would be the map that's on that uh, brochure. Looking at it, it looks like a pretty standard National Park Service map, doesn't it? You see the entirety of the Grand Canyon from Lake Powell up in the, uh, the northeast down to uh, Lake Mead in the southwest, all 277 river miles of, of the park. Uh, this is what we do with most of our brochures. We create a park-wide map. Uh, they've been handing this thing out, and the public, by and large, has found this map to be completely useless. Okay? You know, as you probably know, there's about six million people who visit the, uh, the park every year. The majority go to the South Rim. The majority spend four hours or less at the park and then leave. I mean, such a pity, okay? So, you know, the, the park, you know, came to me saying, look, you know, we need another solution. You know, this map is just not doing the trick. What we would like to do is create a supplemental map that they're going to call a pocket guide. Oh, yeah. And um, the idea was that this would focus on the South Rim itself and be, you know, something small that could fold up into a pocket uh, and be, you know, 17 inches wide and cover the entirety of the South Rim. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll, um, I'll take that on. Um, now, I want to warn you right off the bat that the solution that I came up with, um, if they gave out such things as cartographic licenses, mine would have been revoked by the map that I produced, okay? So, you know, I won't say anything more. Before we, we look at the map, let's just do a little photographic reconnaissance of the South Rim. And when you mention to most people in the world Grand Canyon, this is the image that conjures up their mind. It's uh, sunset at Yavapai Point. It's, it's serene, ma majestic, majestic, beautiful, all these adjectives that, that, that come to mind, okay? And uh, you're just looking at this, this photograph, look at the colors. I'm going to come back to these colors later in my talk. Now, there's another side of the Grand Canyon that most people don't think about. This is a couple hundred yards away. You know, this is the, you know, the parking lot at the visitor center. You know, the, uh, the Coconino Plateau is it's, it's vast. It's largely flat. It's forested. There's not many landmarks. Uh, at the South Rim, uh, the village area, which has grown organically over the years, there's a tangle of roads. Getting around is, is very difficult. Finding parking is very difficult. Visitors have to deal with this situation here before they could get to Yavapai Point. There's uh, you know, also the Grand Canyon Railroad that uh, arrives at the uh, railway station uh, near the rim. People disgorge from the, the train there and get out, and they have to find where the, uh, the canyon is in this, in this landscape. And, uh, and of course, you know, most of us have been there, we know the way, but if you're a first time visitor, that's difficult. That's where my job comes in, is pointing him in the right direction. Uh, to relieve uh, traffic congestion on the, uh, the South Rim, the Park Service now has a, a very nice shuttle bus uh, service, and this is working you know, pretty, pretty well. And, uh, I mean, there's a problem with this too, is uh, you know, people have to acquaint themselves with the bus routes. 
and I, and I say this, you know, as most Americans, including myself, are not really that accustomed to using public transportation. So, you know, bang, right off the bat, they have to learn about this bus system on the, on the South Rim. And for the more energetic uh, visitors to the South Rim, there's the Greenway system of uh, bike trails that people could rent out bikes and, and uh, ride through the forest. And I will mention that there's also a, just a very beautiful rim trail, and bikes are not allowed on that trail for very obvious reasons. <laughs> okay, so uh, enough of the photo reconnaissance. Let's, let's look at maps. The um, South Rim itself uh, stretches for 32 road miles from uh, Hermit's Rest in the west all the way to Desert View um, in the east. So this is, this is the area that the park wanted me to focus on, okay? And most of the visitors go to this area that we call Grand Canyon Village collectively. And what we see here is a, uh, a data dump from OpenStreetMap. I just got all the data for that area. So if you're getting an OpenStreetMap map, this is what you'd be looking at. There's, there's really lots of stuff there. Look at all the houses. There's employee housing. There's 2,000 permanent residents in Grand Canyon Village. That's a lot of people. That's a small city, isn't it? and is also a, you know, a high school. So you really the first step in mapping this area for the public is to get rid of the stuff that the public does not need to see. And whew, that, that really does, does help out, doesn't it? Okay, okay. Uh, but we're not out of the woods yet on, on this. Uh, when you, when you, you know, look at this Grand Canyon Village area closely, there's three nexuses of tourist activity. There's you know, the area that the Park Service calls the village, Market Plaza, and then the visitor center area. So if I'm making a map, look how tightly clustered those buildings are. How in the world would I label these things in a meaningful way for the public? And of course, I think all of you would know the answer. We need insets, don't we, okay? Well, I'm, next slide I'm gonna show you is inset madness. To <laughs> properly to properly map the entire Grand Canyon at the scale that you want to get visitors to uh, where they want to go, you would have to make a map you know, uh, of the entire South Rim to show the, the broad overview, plus have six insets, including insets of insets, uh, which of course is not a very good solution. So this is the, the, the quandary that I was looking at to make a map 17 inches wide of the South Rim. And you know, I was puzzling about how to, to do this, and one of my contacts at the park said, Tom, don't worry, we have the solution for you. Uh, he said, I just went on vacation. Uh, the place where I went had a wonderful map, and what I would like you to do is replicate the map that this place uses, okay? Now, whenever a client suggests a solution to me, all kinds of red flags go up. <laughs> And I think you'll see the reason why. Uh, he went to Disney World. <laughs> so um, I, I had to talk him off the ledge, so to speak. <laughs> and, you know, and I you know, quietly explained it. OK, you know, uh, Disney World is, is fabricated. It's, it's human made. The Grand Canyon is a, is a natural sort of place. Disney World is, is very concentrated. The South Rim is spread over tens of miles. And there's this, this problem of style. Um, you know, <laughs> so, you know, this is not quite in the, uh, the National Park Service look that we, we'd like to project to the, uh, the public. Although I have to admit, looking down to the lower right, I'm really fond of the north arrow that they have. You know, it's <laughs> so um, what I did is I, I, I turned to the uh, the National Park Service graphical identity routes. These were developed by uh, an amazing uh, New York City-based graphic designer named Massimo Vignelli. You can tell he's a graphic designer. He's, you know, he's dressed in black and has a very serious expression. Uh, <laughs> but in 1972, he came up with the, the Unigrid system of, of brochures for the National Park System. Everything was standard. You know, we, could, we could print on standard size sheets of paper, minimize waste, we had a common identity with that black title, title band. Uh, it, it was just a, a phenomenally successful program that Vignelli came up with. And also, you know, he was a, a big believer in this more or less minimalist look. Give the public the information they need to know, leave the stuff out that they don't need to see, okay? 
Now, you know, Vignelli was a, he was a designer. You know, he made product packaging, he did interior design, uh, uh, you know, all, made furniture, all manner of stuff like that. He was not a cartographer, but he did dabble in cartography once. He made the first ever New York City transit map. This was in 1972. And some of you will notice that you know, this map is in the style pioneered by Harry Beck for the London Underground in 1933, I, I believe. Um, so Vignelli came out with the first iteration uh, in, in this modern style of the New York City transit map. Now, I will say that this map was quickly uh, replaced. The public did not take to it very well at all. It's you know, highly di diachromatic. Uh, water areas are shown with a color that I don't normally associate with, uh, with water, you know, even in the polluted days of the 1970s. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that uh, Vignelli did that I think was you know, very interesting on this is he, uh, he treated scale elastically. Uh, to show all of the, uh, the transit routes on Manhattan Island, you could see that he, he widened the island to get all of those in there. And that gave me the, uh, the big idea, you know, maybe I could do something like that for the South Rim. Okay, hold on to your seats. I, uh, I got into Adobe Illustrator and uh, loaded up a, uh, a proper planimetric base map of the South Rim and then just started messing around. And this is the map that I, I eventually came up with, okay? Um, it's essentially a, a caricature of, of the South Rim. I'll, I'll admit that right off, off the bat. And let me explain some of the uh, purposeful distortions that I built into this map. The area within this yellow oval, uh, that's about two and a half miles wide. Remember, the entire South Rim from you know, Desert View to Hermit's Rest is 32 miles. Wow, I am really g getting pretty radical here. And, and what's, what's more, uh, within that uh, large yellow circle, these areas I further expanded just to air them out so I could show people what was there and label them. Alrighty? Now, um, I will explain you know, a few slides from now how I conveyed this purposeful distortion to the public, and you could judge whether it works or not. Okay. So here's the uh, here's the map uh, of the uh, the base map of the uh, the South Rim that I, I created. Um, the first thing that I did is you know you can see all the uh, the building footprints shown in black. Uh, now, if, if I was to ask you, what does the footprint of the Memorial Union Building look like from above? Does anyone really know? Yeah, I sure don't, but I kind of know what it looks like from the outside. So the, f the first thing that I did was to um, show all of the buildings in this sort of pseudo three-dimensional style, this cartoonish style, and Dory's going to be talking about that, I think, to at tomorrow's uh, um, keynote. We'll probably see something uh, similar. You know, these things, well, they, they look cute. They draw attention to themselves, and people could recognize them uh, more readily than uh, standard uh, footprints. Now, I was, I was working very closely with my colleagues at, at the park at all stages of this map design and production. I showed them this, uh, this, this base map, and much to my surprise, a lot of people did not realize that that darker beige color in the background was the, uh, the canyon. And that lighter green area in the foreground was the Coconino Plateau. You know, you could see some, some bits of cliff on, uh, on the left and the right. I thought that would be enough to uh, cue people in. Uh, it wasn't. And it's always humbling to get this kind of feedback from people. It's obvious to me, you know, you know what things were because I made it, but not, other people are not seeing it. So I, uh, I added a little bit of uh, topographic texture to the background, and I think that removed all doubt as to where the Grand Canyon was on, on this map. Okay, um, next up, I put a black band on it. You know, we're the Park Service. We, we love our black identity um, bands. And one of the things you'll notice on this map, the, the colors are very muted. The roads are white. And th that's because this map also had to serve as a transit map for the bus system, which are color-coded. And I wanted these bright colors to apply uh, to the bus route. So, I added the, uh, the bus routes inside the, uh, the roads. So at this point, the base map was more or less you know, complete. 
Now, I would say this map now is more or less a picture, and really to bring you know, meaning to maps, you need to put labels on the map. And I have a couple labels that I added to it. <laughs> My or original idea was that the map would have probably half as many labels on there, uh, especially on the, on the periphery going out to Hermit's Rest and uh, uh, Desert View. The park staff reviewing this, of which there was probably well over 100 people, had different ideas about that. Everyone had their own agenda. And so uh, you know, over time, over months, I would get emails and I would kind of cringe. It's like, Tom, add this, add this, add that, and so forth. It was, it was quite the challenge. Um, I tried to build in uh, visual hierarchies with, with the labels so you can see the most important things you know, in the forefront, bolder coming, coming out. I also used all the symbols. I clustered them in areas to give more weight to the areas where uh, visitors would be going so they could you know, focus on those um, areas first. Now. You're probably thinking, okay, you know, you know he, he crafted himself you know, a pretty nice map here, but it's completely distorted. People are gonna get confused by this thing. How do you convey to the public that this map is not to scale? It's grossly not to scale. The first thing I did is I put these, these red scale arrows up at the top. You know, it kind of says, okay, this is you know, so many miles from here to here. Um, the, the park uh, had this at the visitor center desk. They were showing this to the public no one noticed it, okay? It, you know, this was a cartographic fail. Um, it's like, uh-oh, this is the problem. So my, my, my next solution was to, you know, put an oval there, okay? Just kind of, okay, there it is. This, you know, the map not to scale, you know, this, this, this area is enlarged. And th this was my working version of the map for a couple months. The, this thing took a long time to, to make. And uh, I thought this was working out fairly well. And about a week before it was published, I, I had an epiphany. In, instead of using just a, an oval like that with a, a, a drop shadow, I decided to make that oval into a magnifying lens itself, kind of a device, a skeuomorphic device to say, OK, you know, this area is being enlarged. And look, I, I also put the, uh, the, the red scale bars back in, too. You know, in, in, uh, Studying cartography, one of the things that's drilled into our head is that redundancy is evil on a map, that you don't do it. Uh, throughout my 40-year you know, career in cartography, I've learned to cherish redundancy. People read maps and learn in different ways, and if you could come at it in, with different approaches and people get it, so much the better. So um, here's the map, but wait, there's more. Let's slide it down. Um, of course, this is the National Park Service. They want to put all kinds of stuff on these things. You know, uh, white space is evil. It must, it must be filled. <laughs> let's, let's look at some of the uh, other stuff that's uh, on the map. Uh, you know, distance charts for, for walkers, bikers, and road distances. So you could you know, refer to these charts and see how far things are. Um, pictograph symbols, these, little, these symbols representing all the various services that you'll find at the National, at the national Park. Uh, a typical National Park Service map probably has four, five, six of these symbols, uh, different symbols on it. The South Rim pocket map has the record with 21. It's a, it's a contest. Whoever has the most symbols wins, uh, and they win by a long shot on this. Then there's the, uh, the, uh, the, the bus information here. Now, one of the things I want to uh, show to you is that if you look at the map above, most of the bus routes run east-west, don't they? Look at the charts. How, what's the orientation on those? Yeah, kind of vertically, north-south, right? So there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a real geographic disconnect between the two. I had originally designed the charts so that they were more horizontal in format, but the park overruled me on that, on that and we have these to deal with right now. And the North Arrow. The typical uh, National Park Service North Arrow just has the label North because East and West is so important. I decided that I need to label uh, those direct cardinal directions as, as well. And also, I mean, with six million people visiting the park, I don't know if people necessarily, you know, if they just see North, would know which way East or West was in relationship <laughs> to North. I know, it's, it, you know, you have to really account for, for everything. Okay, the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the map is 17 inches wide. It has eight panels. When you fold it in half, 
um, the the map itself, the important, the heart of the uh, the South River, ap appears in the in the top um, four panels. My wife Val is hand modeling it uh, right there. This map was um, a draft of it I created in the winter of uh, 2015, 2016. The park printed up a small print run of 300,000 copies to test to test it. Uh, uh, doing user testing uh, is very difficult in the National Park Service. You have to get Office of Management and Budget approval. It can take 10 months to do. They basically uh, relied on, on the bus drivers and the staff at the visitor center uh, for feedback they were getting from visitors. After that, that, that uh, initial print run of 300,000, they came back to me. I made a few tweaks to the map. And then uh, they started printing it uh, with print runs of 3.5 million every year. And, and that, you know, that, that really gives you pause. I mean, <laughs> you have to scrutinize every label. You don't want a misspelled word when you have three and a half billion being uh, printed. So, so that's the, uh, the, the pocket map. It's, uh, it's still in use today, although I hear rumors that they may be swapping it out for something else. But that's not my concern anymore. <laughs> so let's uh, move on to the second map. So having uh, dealt with uh, the six million visitors who are congregated on the South Rim, they wanted a second map. And this, this one showing hiking below the rims for the more adventurous uh, visitors to the uh, Grand Canyon. You know, here's a typical view down in the canyon. This is the, uh, the South Kaibab Trail up near the top. Uh, you, know, you know, obviously this is a completely different experience than what visitors on the rim would have. Um, you know, for one thing, it's, you know, there's, there's a potential danger. You know, you, you, know, you walk down into the canyon, it's, it's very seductive, it's, it's beautiful, it's an easy trail going down, but of course the problem is you have to get back up, and uh, the, the Park Service is just, just very concerned um, with that. Uh, and, and people die there, and we'll be hearing more about death in the Grand Canyon tomorrow with Ken Field's talk in all the morbid detail that you want to hear. So um, making a uh, hiking map, um, I thought it was very important to you know, show topography uh, properly um, on it. And uh, I, in, th in this case, I turned to uh, Brad and Barbara Washburn, this inseparable couple from the Boston Museum of Science. You're going to be hearing a lot about this map, including later this morning, uh, Michael Fry's uh, talk. So I won't really get into this at all. I'll just say this, this is just one of the most amazing mapping efforts uh, ever done. It, it, was, it, was, it was a family affair with, with friends at first, and then other organizations got started, and they ended up with you know, the heart of the Grand Canyon map. Uh, it was a seven-year um, effort. As you know, Brett Watch, Washburn noted, uh, you know, you know, mapping the Grand Canyon, the inverted topography of the Grand Canyon, the challenge was like mapping a map, uh, a mountain upside down. It's not your traditional map. Uh, he turned to uh, Swiss Topo in Switzerland for their, their rock depiction um, skills to show the various cliff bands. And I really liked this technique, and I wanted to replicate it digitally. I used a technique called texture shading, which was developed by uh, a fellow named Leland Brown. He's a rocket scientist, literally, from Southern um, California, big hiker. And he discovered a way to manipulate digital elevation models, such as we see here. Uh, darker is lower, lighter is higher in this representation. And what texture shading does is it, it detects abrupt changes in elevation on a digital elevation model and amplifies those differences in, with increased contrast. So if uh, you know, uh, another uh, uh, person implemented it in software called Natural Scene Designer, and we have some really nice um, slider bars for, for doing this. There's advanced you know, mathematics behind all of this. But if you slide uh, the bottom sliders over a little bit, you can see how the contrast is increased, okay? You can see the ledginess of Grand Canyon a little bit better. And if you slide that, that second from the bottom slider all the way over, look what happens. It's an awful mess, right? Okay, you're probably not too impressed by what I'm showing you right now. Watch what happens now. Here's the, um, here's the, the central part of the Grand Canyon. Um, the, the visitor center would be at the bottom center, Phantom Ranch, uh, kind of near the, the top of the Colorado River. Uh, I think many of you recognize this, this scene. This is shown with uh, shade relief generated from a, a, a 10 meter DEM, the highest resolution DEM, now publicly available for the Grand Canyon. It's a pretty good shade relief, wouldn't you say? 
let's uh, combine that with texture shading, okay? So this is 60% uh, shade relief, 40% uh, uh, texture shading with normal blending mode in Adobe Photoshop, and all of a sudden you start seeing the, the levels of, of, uh, of the canyon much, much better. Now, let's add those, uh, that really noisy texture on top of it, and this is also in Photoshop with soft light um, blending mode, and you can see the rock textures there. But wait, it's getting kind of noisy, isn't it? So what I did is I uh, took uh, the DEM, created a slope mask from that, and eliminated the rock texture from flat areas and areas of gentle slope, and we have something that like, looks like this. This is getting pretty, pretty close to you know, what the Swiss were drawing by hand with their, their rock um, texturing. You can see the cliff bands very well, the talus slopes, and you can see the areas that are, are flat. Let's uh, go back to the original shade of relief and back to that product. So I, I think that was you know, an improvement. Now, uh, you know, this, is, this map is for the public. We don't want to leave it grayscale, so it needs to be colorized. And these are the colors that I came up with. You know, I'll just say that colors are just one of those intangible aspects of map design. You know, people glance at a map and, you know, you want them to relate to the colors, be attracted to it instantly. You know, I, I think of colors as the pheromones of map design. It's just like, it's like dating, you know, it's like, yeah, the instant liker. And, and you want to get that. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the colors here, except for, notice the Colorado River. It's a nice, pretty blue. Yeah. <laughs> if I had shown the, the Colorado River with its, you know, natural water color, you would not see it on the map because it basically blends in with the land. So, so. Um, had to make uh, allowances there. Here's the uh, the labels that I uh, put on the map. Note how the uh, the, the trails are highlighted yellow. Uh, at the visitor centers, the, the rangers often just get a highlighter out and show you where to go. I saved them the trouble and just highlighted it uh, myself. And here here's the uh, the hiking map compared to uh, Washburn's Hard the Grand Canyon map. Um, you know, one of the things you'll notice is that you know uh, my map is a lot lighter. And that's because legibility is of paramount importance to the National Park Service. We want people to be able to read the labels. Uh, some of us, like myself, are retired, getting a little bit older. Our eyes aren't as you know, sharp as they once were. We want all the labels to be readable. Frankly, if I had uh, turned in a map like Washburn's, my bosses would have called me into the private conference room for a, a conversation. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, on the other hand, it's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous uh, map. Here's the, uh, the hiking map in its entirety. Um, you know, so it shows the, th the three main trails into the, uh, into the canyon. In the upper left, you'll notice that there's some um, distance charts up there. It, you know, it's uh, green, yellow, and red. We're using the, the stoplight uh, colors to kind of warn people that, okay, green, this is a place you could hike down to pretty safely on, on a day hike. Yellow, start using caution. Red, be really, really careful, and you know, only experts um, should go there. Okay, so two maps down. So, map for hikers, a map for visitors uh, up on the rim, on, on the south rim. There's still the park brochure, and uh, we decided we would redo that from scratch, and I'll tell you about how we handle that. If we went back to 1982, uh, this is the map that you would receive when you entered the park. And looking at this, this looks like a classic National Park Service map, doesn't it? It's pretty nice. It's got a, a grayscale shade of relief. My predecessor, Bill Von Allman, airbrushed that. Unfortunately, it's just kind of printed in a kind of a dingy gray. Look at the colors on the map. Um, they kind of dominate all else. You see the park shape. You see, you know, surrounding, you know, uh, reservations and federal lands and, and, and so forth. It, the, this. The, the colors that you saw on the map, you see on, on, on this map, don't really emphasize what visitors see when they go to the Grand Canyon. Think about that first slide of Yavva by Point at, at sunset. This has no relationship to that at all. And that really bothered my next cartographic hero, a, a fellow named Hal Shelton. He was a, uh, a trained fine artist from Southern California. Through happenstance, he found himself working for the U.S. Geological Survey as a cartographer, and he revolted against the use of administrative land colors and hypsometric tints, calling them arbitrary. 
what he advocated instead is the use of natural colors on, on maps, such as you know, what he would paint in that painting that we see on the left. His brother was a uh, geologist and a pilot, and Pal would often fly around the western U.S. with him, and uh, you know, he would look at the colors on the ground. Uh, his, his brother published Geology Illustrated. Some of you might know that, that wonderful um, book. Anyway, what Hal came up with was a way of natural color mapping. We see that in the lower right. And what's extraordinary about this technique is that he did this in the 1950s and 1960s. This is before the advent of satellites and satellite-derived land cover. So, I mean, this was really kind of a, a huge leap in, in visualization of what the Earth would look like um, from above. And I wanted to emulate this. So this is the initial mock-up. Um, I did this with Melinda Schmidt, the designer at Harvest Ferry Center. You know, this is you know, really rough, you know, how we thought, saw the whole side of the brochure looking. And um, what I want to focus on right now is this uh, central section of the canyon and show you how I developed a map with natural colors, similar to Hal Shelton's um, style. Right now, we see a grayscale map. It's shade relief and texture shading combined. We've been there, done that already. Um, the Grand Canyon is largely uh, an arid environment, so the first step is I, uh, I just made it kind of beige, made it look uh, a little bit drier. But you know, as most of us know, the Grand Canyon is more than arid lands. You know, five of the seven life zones in North America are found in Grand Canyon National Park. Yes, can you hear me? Having problems? Is that better? Okay, I'll project. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I wanted to show um, forested areas, so I added a forest texture to the, uh, the high plateaus. Uh, getting this involved going into Photoshop, creating a, uh, a, a forest canopy uh, texture, you know, graphically. Kind of looks like a bacterium, but when applied to the map, it kind of looks like forest, I hope. I initially was using uh, the USGS's National Land Cover data set, uh, which shows uh, percent forest canopy to apply that texture to the, uh, the plateaus. But look, but look how ragged that distribution is. You could see some uh, you know, big fire burns and it's, it's kind of messy. So what I did instead is I used that same distribution. I got a grayscale digital elevation model and I used this to apply that, that, that green forest texture to the high, high plateaus. Um, and I, I think it just works more successfully. I mean, these, these grayscale DEMs almost look sensuous, and I just wanted a, you know, a general indication of where there was more biomass, you know, in the, uh, uh, on, on the plateaus. You know, you'll notice that with the DEM, the higher you go, the lighter it is, that means more green would have um, fall onto the final map. So here's the, um, here's the map with the, the forest textures added. Now, usually when designing a map, there's, there's one element that's the crux of the design, and that's the next one I'm going to show you. It's the, uh, I wanted the, the, the canyon really to pop out, so I got into Photoshop and just tinted it, you know, this you know, kind of bright glowing color. Think Yavapai point uh, again. Now, um, it, it, I make this sound very, you know, casual, you know, uh, to put that tint in, I actually had to go in and spend six hours tracing the rim of the, uh, of the canyon. Notice how uh, on, on the tributary canyons, Kanab Creek and Havasu Creek, they kind of fade out. They're not as, as strong. So that applied that, that color to the, uh, the canyon. Now, I think this is you know, getting a, a, is a step in the right direction, but it doesn't look quite as deep as it should. So in the next step, I went back to that digital elevation model and used that to darken the canyon bottom, okay? etching it right into the, uh, the Colorado um, Plateau. And I, th I think an added benefit of this is that, you know, uh, it shows the, um, the inner gorge better. And of course, you know, in the inner gorge, we have the you know, Precambrian, you know, uh, Vishnu schists and those, those darker rocks, which this map suggests. Okay. Then I added some uh, very subtle highlights and blue shadows to the, the highest areas. You know, I'll toggle this a couple times. It's subtle, but I, um, I, I think adding blue shadows to the higher area suggests that you were getting into the Hudsonian uh, you know, cl you know, uh, climate realm up on the uh, Kaibab uh, Plateau. Uh, 
and now um, I added the, uh, the Colorado River. Notice that the Colorado River is, um, is multicolored. Um, you can see sun glints on it. I did this for uh, a couple reasons. I, I wanted the, the river to be noticeable and having glints gives it a little more life. And, and the river course is a, you know, it's dynamic. It's, it's flowing and by showing these sun glints, it suggests that dyna dynamism of, of the river. Now, one last um, touch to this uh, map was adding foreground shadow and background haze. If you, if you look at classic uh, landscape paintings by the Hudson River School of Painters or Thomas Moran's Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, you'll notice that the foreground is often very dark. The background is kind of hazed out a little bit, and that kind of uh, directs your eye to the, the center of the painting. The same thing can be done with a map. And so, you know, with that foreground shadow and the background haze, we are now focused uh, almost exclusively on the, on the canyon itself. Base map is complete. Can you guess what's coming next? A, a, a couple labels. <laughs> and, and actually, there's fewer labels uh, on this map. Um, this is the first cut at the labels. They were, they're showing up fairly well. Then I added halos and, and drop shadows to make them uh, pop a little bit more. One thing to notice on this map is what you don't see. You don't see roads, do you? Uh, the park boundary is in there. It's very light. It's a, a yellow line. This map is intended to show the Grand Canyon in its, its natural splendor without the you know, imprint of humans. Uh, now, I do have some cultural reference points on there. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very surprised. I'm, I, did, I made a draft of this map a year and a half ago. I thought uh, that the, the park would insist on showing roads and all this other stuff. They, they really held off. This is the, um, the final map um, uh, in the brochure. This, this incidentally was printed about three weeks ago. So um, in the next couple months when you go to the, uh, the park, you'll be receiving um, this, this map. Um, my colleague Melinda Schmidt did the, uh, the layout on this. What's interesting is, by and large, National Park staff, they tend to focus a lot on the text and the uh, photographs uh, on these brochures, the maps, they don't scrutinize nearly as, as carefully. And it's, it's probably good that they do. Uh, this was uh, a very early draft, and it was a major, major problem that was discovered on this after one week. If you look at the little inset map uh, down at the bottom left, you'll see a little critter uh, sitting on it. OK. That is a ring-tailed lemur from Madagascar. <laughs> um, let's fix it. There's a ring-tailed cat. <laughs> Can you imagine printing three and a half million copies with a lemur on it? <laughs> There's a reason why we, we, we take our time and, 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 and get these things right. OK. Um, oh, and I'll, I'll, I'll add um, one more thing, there's a, a verso to this, this map, and uh, it includes more interpretive information, including a splendid geologic uh, column, which uh, Carl Car Carlstrom uh, contributed to, and we'll be hearing more about that, hopefully, um, later in the, um, the conference. So um, very quickly, and I'll, I'll finish this thing up. How are we doing for time? OK. Um, this is a map that I created in the year 2000. Um, it's, it's a panoramic map of the, of the Grand Canyon. And my inspiration for this was um, Heinrich Moran. He, uh, he's an Austrian, was an Austrian, he's dead now, obviously. Um, and in his career, he, he painted over 500 ski area panoramas and um, panoramas of other places, ocean bottom maps, you know, including four panoramas of national parks. You know, here we're looking at Yosemite. He also painted uh, uh, Yellowstone, Denali, and North Cascades. Uh, you know, the, these are, you know, uh, one meter wide posters that he, that he created. They're, they're absolutely lovely and wonderful. Incidentally, we, um, we digitally remastered all of his artwork uh, recently. They're up online. I have a URL at the end of my talk. Go there, download these things. They're absolutely beautiful. They're in the public domain. You could print them out in all their uh, colorful um, glory. Um, anyway, Baran was a master of painting panoramas. You could see him. He, he's wearing his favorite uh, vest. He's a, he was a flamboyant character. And his artwork was also flamboyant. 
And he inspired me to create a panorama of the National, um, Grand Canyon National Park. Now, I'm not nearly as flamboyant uh, as Baran, nor are my maps. And this was intended to work as a get around map uh, for the South Rim. Now, one of the things, one of the important things that I uh, borrowed from Baran was uh, how to portray the foreground and the background in, a, in the panorama. If you're flying over landscape in an airplane like I was yesterday afternoon, you're by the window, you look out the window, and you look toward the horizon, you see the horizon line and the sky, okay? Everything is in profile. If you turn your eyes down and look down, everything is planimetric, it's more map-like. That's very hard to get in a 3D oblique view generated by computer um, software. So uh, looking at this map of the Grand Canyon, you'll notice that the foreground is fairly map-like, and in the background, it, you could see the, uh, the profile of, of the North Rim fairly well. I achieved this with a software called uh, Terrain Bender by Bernhard Yeni, uh, then of Oregon State University, now of Monash uh, University in uh, Melbourne, Australia. With Terrain Bender, what you could do is load a digital elevation model and warp it. This is kind of a common theme in a lot of my mapping, is distorting and warping things. Um, but with Terrain Bender, you could uh, add curvature to a DEM, and when you look at it from the front, it forces the, the foreground into more of a planimetric view, and the background looks more as if it's in uh, profile. And this is the, uh, the final map that resulted. Again, this was in the year 2000. You know, I thought that this was kind of a, a wild solution for the Grand Canyon uh, uh, map. Uh, to my utter amazement, they actually used this for 15 years. Uh, it really had a real, it really had a long reign, run. And this is in a park that likes to swap out maps very regularly. So I was quite pleased that that it lasted as long as it, it did. Well, I will, um, I'll conclude right now just by making a, a few statements. When I, uh, when I I began my career in cartography just about 40 years ago, you know, I, I, I looked at you know people like Moran and Washburn, Vignelli, uh, Shelton with you know you know amazement. You know, they, they were the the pillar of cartographic um, excellence. They they were the people I aspired to um, emulate, and uh, thankfully, you know, during the course of my career, something really wonderful happened. It was the digital revolution. We we have now marvelous you know cartography and gis tools you know gobs of fantastic geospatial data available uh fantastic graphical software at our our disposal and you know i'll say that you know most of us you know with a little bit of perseverance and these wonderful tools and these wonderful data can now achieve what these former masters of the uh, the manual era uh created and it's, it's just a wonderful thing i think nowadays is is the best time ever to be a cartographer, you know, given what we can do. You know, Adobe had this, this tagline uh, uh, some years ago, you know, if, if, if you can dream it, you can do it. And that's quite literally the case with cartography uh, nowadays. And I'll say it's more appropriate than ever when you're mapping a place like um, Grand Canyon National Park. So I will end on that note and open the floor to any questions you have. Did I break it? Oof, gosh. <laughs> All right. Who's up? Who has a question? We'll take that gentleman first. That handsome gentleman, Peter Corbett. Peter, I'm going to throw this to you. <laughs> it's still working. Now it works. Uh, Tom, I wondered if there's a, uh, a record of the National Park Service maps going back to the uh, 1919 forward that you uh, that are somewhere in some collection. My my office has them going back to uh, uh, around World War II. So we you know uh, at Harpers Ferry Center we we have all of those maps and brochures going back to that time. Um, 
I would say that the Library of Congress uh, Geography Map Division would be the place to go to find everything else. Probably not. Yeah. So uh, it looks to me like in your maps that you pretty much understand this or whatever, but how uh, aware are cartographers in general with the colorblind males in the U.S.? Well, you're, um, you're talking to one right now. <laughs> I'm a sufferer of deuteranopia. <laughs> no, um, I have slight red-green colorblindness, so I'm, I'm usually if I can see the, the colors uh, fairly well. Most people with red-green colorblindness can kind of see them. Um, what I try to do is when I'm using reds and greens is to have a value difference uh, you know, between the reds and the greens so you could differentiate them um, that way. Um, but yeah, it, it, is, it is a concern and uh, unfortunately not all cartographers take that into account. I can think of some, some major map publishers who just blow it off, you know. Two questions. First one is, if I showed up at Harper's Ferry, could I get maps of Grand Canyon, Bryce, Zion, what have you, from the Park Service there? Is that possible? And the second question is, who are these people that get to live in this village in the Grand Canyon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, if you showed up at Harper's Ferry, we, you know, we usually have about a dozen of each new printing uh, of the maps and brochures available. But it would probably be easier if you went to um, federal office buildings in any major city. They, there's usually a Department of Interior National Park Service office there where you could find these maps. So that would be a little bit easier. What was your second question? Who lives in Harpers Ferry? Oh. Um, you know, I would say it's you know National Park Service staff and uh, a lot of contractors and concessioners uh, as well, and and dependents. Yeah. Hi. Uh, oh, that's loud. Um, I was wondering about what you said about the elasticity of scale, like how you manipulated that, and then also the fact that you changed like the river blue, like um, because that attracts people more. And if like you had it as its natural color, it would blend in. I was wondering if you thought that. There was the trade-off between like keeping things to their like natural scales and natural colors and attracting like people like like having people pr understand that map better. Do you think there's like there's like a cost to having things like more attractive at the cost of like maybe the truth of what they actually look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question and, and it's something that I've pondered a lot throughout my career. My natural inclination is to you to make create maps with colors that are as true to nature as possible so that someone in a park holding a map in their hands can make a connection between that map that they're holding and what they see in, in, in the landscape around them. But sometimes you have to uh, um, alter that uh, philosophy a, a little bit. A classic ex a example of altering it would be the, the greens that you would use in a place like the Grand Canyon to represent forest. If, you, uh, if you're up on an airplane or if you're looking at satellite data of the green forest, you know, look behind me. It's really, really dark. And um, you know, dark green is a visually recessive color, but it's at the top of the plateaus, the highest areas. You look in the canyon, it's reddish, right? Red pops up. So what you have is a graphical inversion of the landscape going on. Um, so this, this is a problem throughout the uh, interior west. So my solution in that case would be to use much lighter greens than what you would observe on the ground to, to represent forest and uh, darker reds you know, uh, in the canyon and, and in the more deserty lowland areas to make it work graphically as a map. And th there is this, you know, this, this you know, uh, uh, sort of tug, and, tug of war between geographic reality and graphic reality that the cartographer has to uh, uh, remedy. I guess that's uh, me. I, 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 I was intrigued by your, your last statement about how today is the best time uh, to be a cartographer with, with the tools that are available. Uh, over the course of your career, you saw this change happen, but you also must have retrained yourself, or the park system must have retrained you. Can, can you talk uh, for a minute about what that transition was like and, 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 and uh, what the what, what, what the office was like at the time when the computers were coming and the 
masking tape and the markers were going away? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I obviously had my, my, my background in the, in, in the late part of the manual uh, era. And I have to confess that I was kind of a, a late comer to digital cartography. You know, not until the, uh, the early 90s did I see the, the, the whole field of digital cartography, the GIS, turning a corner where the, uh, the, the tools and the data could create maps that started to rival what be, could be uh, created uh, manually. So I, I, I kind of went into it, you know, kicking and screaming a little bit. But uh, I'm, I'm so glad I did because it, it's just unleashed a whole new world of possibilities uh, graphically and cartographically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at, at Harpers Ferry Center, uh, initially the maps were not even made in-house. They were contracted out, uh, which is often the case with the government. R.R. Uh, uh, Donnelly um, uh, Cartographic Systems in Lancaster, Pennsylvania did the initial maps. Eventually, the Park Service built up an in-house staff and took over production photomechanically in-house. And then, you know, with the arrival of, uh, of computers and digital data, we, uh, uh, we started doing everything in-house and much quicker and better and more beautiful, I would say. Yeah, it's been, it's been a fantastic ride. I feel very privileged to have you know, seen this major technological revolution occur, you know, during the span of my my career and you know j just starting off in the manual era you know a shade of relief uh, the, what I could now create you know in in an hour might take me a month uh, back in the old days people sometimes ask me you know do I miss you know doing manual shade of relief and the answer is no <laughs> 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 it, it was a it was a means to an end you know <laughs> yeah. I just wondered when you made your first trip to the Grand Canyon, oh. when did you come? When as a I visitor? Yeah, I, I came out there as a visitor, and I spent uh, less than four hours there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but obviously I kept on coming back. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>